a lonely outpost of coral and sand, a thousand miles from anywhere. Yet here, on a blue morning in June 1942, America and Japan fought for control of the Pacific and changed the history of the world. It was one of the greatest naval battles of all time, the turning point of the Second World War in the Pacific. Midway. Here, in a few bloody hours, thousands of young men sacrificed their lives. to the shadowy waters off Midway comes Robert Ballard, the man who discovered the Titanic. Ballard's quest is to find the American and Japanese aircraft carriers that were sunk in the battle, including the USS Yorktown. But the ships are lost more than three miles down, unseen, untouched on the ocean floor. The final resting place of many young men. A story of martyrs and heroes, admirals and airmen, of secret codes and lucky hunches, of lost chances and the painful cost of victory all in one monumental day. Tragedy and triumph, the battle for Midway. Midway. It is hard to ignore the archaeology of war in this place. Nearly a lifetime after the clash at Midway, Four former soldiers walk the island's white coral sands. Two Americans, Bill Sergi and Harry Ferrier, and two Japanese, Haruo Yoshino and Yuji Akamatsu, all veterans of the battle. The last time the veterans were here, they came as enemies. Now, as respectful comrades, they will explore the meaning of their ordeal. I met the two Japanese gentlemen, aviators, and uh, so I've made my peace. And I have no animosity toward them. And uh, they were warriors like we were just doing a job. Welcome aboard. Welcome. All in their 70s now, the survivors have traveled thousands of miles to join undersea explorer Robert Ballard in the search for the five aircraft carriers lost at Midway. Ballard's quest 
sponsored by National Geographic, is to find Bill Sergi's ship, the Yorktown, and Yuji and Haruo's carrier, the Kaga. It will be the voyage of a lifetime for the vets. May 1942. The United States and Japan are at war. It is five months since the devastating sneak attack on the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Now Japan is poised for total domination of East Asia and the Pacific. Pearl Harbor. In a dingy basement beneath command headquarters, Navy codebreakers have pulled off the greatest intelligence coup of the Pacific War. Out of coded enemy radio transmissions, they have teased out the secret plans for the next major Japanese attack. A huge Japanese task force is preparing to strike a crippling blow against the already weakened U.S. Navy. It will happen at Midway, as early as June 3rd, less than a month away. Yet now, the U.S. knows what's coming, and the Americans will lie in wait, hoping to ambush the Japanese fleet. Day one of the Ballard Expedition. To begin their exploration of the past, the veterans travel with Ballard 180 miles from Midway to the place where Ballard thinks the Yorktown went down. There is no X to mark this spot, just blue water and the occasional goonie bird. But below the waves, Ballard believes he will discover history. For here, young men came to fight and to die. Well, I mean, to be at the very spot, you know, this is where the battle took place. This is like going to Gettysburg. This is like going to Bull Run. This is like going to Normandy. This is where a great chapter in human history, tragic, in many ways, was played out on the stage, and we're on the stage right now. While Ballard studies the terrain, the veterans explore their own landscape of memory and loss. This is what I looked like back then. Oh. 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 Pearl Harbor. Uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, Pearl Harbor. This picture was taken before the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, 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 uh. Ah. This yeah. was me. Yes. I was in the center. Oh, this. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think this is what saved my life. This is the hat I was wearing at the time. Oh, You can not me, you. Mm. Very brave. <laughs> you come this year. Very brave. Uh, yeah. It's a kind of miracle again. Yeah. Uh, a little older, a little wiser. <laughs> Pearl Harbor, 1942. Yorktown sailor Bill Sergi hears they're headed for a place called Midway. The word Midway was a mystique mystery, 
uh, an awesome word to, to banter about. We were not fully aware of what actually was going on there. So all we knew was that we needed help at Midway. Yorktown will rendezvous with her sister ships, Hornet and Enterprise, at a point approximately 325 miles northeast of Midway. Their mission, to ambush the Japanese. At the same time, four Japanese carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu, under the command of Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, are steaming for Midway. These are the same machines and men who bombed Pearl Harbor. The Japanese know nothing of the American trap awaiting them. Many of the American airmen and sailors headed toward Midway have never faced enemy fire, including Yorktown radioman and gunner Lloyd Childers. Childers was attached to a torpedo bomber squadron. He can't forget an intelligence briefing he attended with other crews. He said, if a 15-plane squadron of TBDs makes torpedo runs against a determined um, Japanese fleet, if three of you get through to deliver torpedoes, we will have considered that you've accomplished your mission. And I immediately became alarmed because the odds were not good. Lloyd Childers will soon find out just how bad the odds really are. It's the seventh day of the expedition. Time to part the waves and take the first glimpse of the bottom, three miles down. Ballard's eyes will be the U.S. Navy's remotely operated robot explorer called the ATV, equipped with lights and video cameras. Safety officer online, PCS online, aye? Will Ballard finally, after years of planning and enormous effort, be able to find the downed Yorktown? When ready, unlatch and lower the vehicle into the water. When ready, unlatch and lower the vehicle into the water. For the veterans, the ATV is a time machine, carrying them back to a distant world of fury and fire. All stations, LRS, pouring the vehicle into the water now. Go mid bay out. Pilot fly away. I remember walking up and down those decks, and 56 years after the fact, I'm going to look at those decks again. And it'll bring back memories. The ATV has now traveled over two miles and almost five decades. The ocean bottom is getting close. 12,000 feet, the depth Ballard found Titanic. All stations, pilot, passing 15,000 feet. Passing 15,000 feet, aye. Approaching 16,000, the depth Ballard found the battleship Bismarck. Nearing the sea floor, deeper than Ballard has ever gone before. Two tag tag, two tag. Oh, no, 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 take it. Fly away, pilot. Under the relentless pressure of the ocean depths, key equipment on the ATV has imploded. It has collapsed into itself, reducing metal and glass to rubble. The ATV is crippled. Just how badly, no one yet knows. 
It's a disaster that may mean the end of the expedition. June 3rd, 1942. The white sands of Midway are now heavily defended by hundreds of young American servicemen and dozens of bombers, fighters, torpedo planes. The battle is less than 24 hours away. Among those waiting is a small six-plane torpedo bomber squadron. Both the planes and their crews are untested in combat, but the young pilots are eager to face the Japanese. 17-year-old Harry Ferrier served as a radio man and gunner. You don't think about the fact that people do get killed. You know, as a teenager, which I really was, you think you're immortal. And we had what we thought were the best airplanes that the Navy had come up with. And we would really give the Japanese you know, the hell, I guess you'd say, and uh, come back. And it didn't work that way. Dawn, June 4th, nearly six months to the day since Pearl Harbor. 240 miles from Midway, Admiral Chuichi Nagumo readies his attack. He is supremely confident of the final outcome and utterly unaware of the American aircraft carriers slowly closing in. My spirits were, well, up to then we had won every battle we fought, so we thought we would win again. Now is the moment of attack. Six AM. With Japanese aircraft bearing down, the American planes on Midway scramble into the air. With them is the torpedo bomber carrying Harry Ferrier, Bert Ernest, and the third member of their crew, Jay Manning, the turret gunner. They're going after the Japanese carriers. Ernest, Ferrier, and Manning clear the island just minutes before enemy planes hit Midway. The Americans fight back with everything they've got. Less than half an hour later, the first Japanese strike is over. But if the enemy aircraft carriers are not stopped soon, Midway may fall. Six fifty a.m., June fourth, nineteen forty-two. 
160 miles from a battle-torn midway, the torpedo bomber carrying Ferrier, Ernest, and Manning heads straight at the Japanese fleet. As they near the carriers, the Japanese fighter attack becomes more intense and tragically effective. Very shortly, Manning stopped firing, and so I looked back over my shoulder to see what was going on, and uh, he was just hanging down in his uh, harness in, in the turret, but obviously had been killed. And then, really, the next thing I remember was waking up with my head hanging down, blood pouring off my head. Their plane is shot up, their controls and compass out of commission. Their comrade, Jay Manning, is dead. But Ferrier and Ernest are still alive, and now they have to find their way home. I decided to climb up above the clouds, see if I could see anything, and I did. And when I got up there, I saw a great big plume of smoke over to the east. And realized that probably was Midway, which had been attacked. They managed to land safely in a plane that is literally shot to pieces. After getting patched up at a field hospital, Harry Ferrier waits for the return of the other five planes in his squadron. He waits in vain. It was afternoon, you know, or, or early afternoon, and it became obvious that our airplane was the only one that had come back, that the other five did not. And uh, we eventually just had to accept the fact that they all five were shot down. It is day eight of the expedition. Ballard's robot explorer, the ATV, is still crippled. And the Navy doesn't know if they can get it up and fully running again. They need more time, the one thing Ballard can't spare. Fortunately, the sonar is still going strong. Instead of just waiting, Ballard leaves the phantom Yorktown behind to look for Japanese carriers at a site 170 miles away. The Japanese veterans have not seen these waters in 56 years, not since the death of their ship, the Kaga. Yet here, time is erased. My heart is racing in anticipation of seeing the ship. I keep remembering the image of the sinking carrier. I hope it is found soon. After all the frustration and delay, the ATV makes it to the bottom of the sea. But all too soon, Ballard realizes the bottom is barren. No carrier, no planes, just rocks and mud. There's no excuses. I just didn't find it. Period. Round one. <laughs> Chicago. I'll get the Yorktown. 
I'm going, I really want the Yorktown. That's where I'm headed. But one unspoken question is inescapable. If the sonar was wrong about finding the Kaga, is it also wrong about the location of the Yorktown? Seven a.m., the water's off Midway. The Japanese commander, Admiral Nagumo, is still completely in the dark about the trap awaiting him. Eight twenty a.m., Admiral Nagumo receives truly startling news. His scout planes sight the one thing they never expected to see: an American carrier. Nagumo is shocked to discover he has a real fight on his hands. Now he must decide on his next step. Should he launch a limited strike immediately, or regroup, refuel, and rearm all of his forces, and then obliterate what he believes to be the lone American carrier? He decides to wait. It is a decision that will change the course of the entire war. While Nagumo waits, the American pilots win their way towards his carriers. Yet very quickly, many of the American squadrons get separated from each other. Most of the torpedo bombers find themselves on their own, without fighter protection from the fast, lethal Japanese Zeros. One after another, the young torpedo bomber crews attack just as they have been taught: steady on, low, straight at the target, directly into murderous enemy fire. And one after another, they are blown out of the sky. The Enterprise Torpedo Squadron, 18 out of 28 men, killed. The Yorktowns, 21 out of 24. And of the 30 from Hornet's Torpedo Squad, only one man makes it back. Yet not a single torpedo makes a single successful strike against any of the Japanese carriers. Despite all the sacrifice, the Americans are losing the battle. America is facing defeat at Midway. And the enemy commander, Admiral Nagumo, is set to launch a massive attack against the American carriers. Nagumo's crews work feverishly to get nearly 100 warplanes into the air. Abandoning all caution, they leave explosives and gasoline strewn everywhere. The decks are a disaster waiting to happen. Less than 100 miles away, 19,000 feet up, is the last American hope, the dive bombers. But none of them can find the enemy. The Japanese have taken a 90-degree turn northward to engage the US ships. Then Enterprise's dive bombing squadron plays a hunch and changes course. And in their sights appear the four Japanese carriers, Kaga, Akagi, Soryu, and here you. And there is not a Japanese fighter anywhere to be seen. The enemy fighters are still too busy defending their carriers against the last of the American torpedo planes to stop the dive bombers high above. It's a sight Lieutenant Dick Best has been longing for. 
I was amazed to see that uh, the deck was a bright yellow because our decks had been, a, had been stained a North Pacific blue ever since the start of the war. And in, not, in addition to the deck being a bright yellow, the big rising sun up forward of the elevator, it was glowing red, was like a tremendous advertisement. And here we are, that we are the Japanese Navy. He dives toward the rising sun. and releases his bomb, as does the rest of his group, onto Japanese decks now crowded with torpedoes, bombs, gasoline, planes, and men. And she was a mass of flames from bow to stern with tremendous eruption coming up every four to five seconds as a bomb must have hit. Japanese survivors float hour after hour in the water in silence with the dead and dying as Kaga burns. Most are rescued by other Japanese ships, but not all. We were fortunate to have been rescued so quickly, but there were still men left swimming and they committed suicide. In five short minutes, Kaga, Akagi, and Soryu have been devastated. Scores of planes destroyed, many hundreds of young men killed. Many of the Japanese airmen are caught in the sky above their burning ships with nowhere to land. In just five minutes, the cream of the Japanese Navy is finished. But the battle is far from over. Uh, at first, I would like to read a letter to my friends here. Ballard's search for the Japanese carriers has failed, and the two Japanese veterans will soon leave the Laney Choist. But the voyage to Midway allows Haruo and Yuji the opportunity to bid their fallen comrades one last farewell and to remember all the young men who died in battle. We believe that the innumerable spirits who sacrificed their lives for their country should be forever honored for their distinguished service. We are honored to have fought alongside you in battle. Veterans from both countries have overcome past animosities and have pledged a renewed peace. Spirits, please rest in peace. You bet. So I was thinking as Haruo and Yuchi were paying homage to their shipmates that I too lost 45 shipmates at this very spot as all the planes in my squadron except the one I was in were actually shot down here among the Japanese battle force. So this was a very solemn moment for me as well as for them. a.m. on June 4th. Admiral Nagumo regroups his surviving planes on the deck of Hiryu, the only carrier to escape American bombs. There is still a chance to emerge victorious. The Japanese pilots take off, heading for the closest American carrier. 
Yorktown. The enemy dive bombers score three hits, killing more than a dozen men. But unlike the Japanese carriers, there are no bombs, torpedoes, or fuel on deck waiting to explode. For all the smoke and fire, Yorktown is still afloat. Two hours later, as the Yorktown continues to patch herself up, a second wave of enemy planes target the carrier. Yorktown's fighter pilots scramble, eager to engage the enemy. Down goes one Japanese torpedo bomber after another. But still, the enemy comes. I look out there and here's this torpedo coming and it looks like a brand new nickel just comes shining through the water right beneath us. And I said, oh my God, this is it. And it goes off. One American carrier is down. The Japanese carrier Hiryu must be stopped fast. When they find it, Lieutenant Dick Best is right there once again. And uh, I did look back when I was far enough out to the west to turn, and she was aflame and burning just the way the ones in the morning had been. I felt myself to be the lord of creation of the time. The sense of accomplishment and, and the fulfillment of revenge is so sweet that I, I, I don't think I ever felt anything as intensely again in all my life. Caught in the inferno on the Hiryu is Taisuke Maruyama, one of the torpedo pilots who had just crippled the Yorktown. <laughs> The maintenance crews and emergency crews who had tried to extinguish the fire were injured by the explosion, and many lost their legs and hands. The military doctor was operating on them on the deck, soaked in blood. The troops were burnt black, dead bodies strewn across the deck. Hiryu, Soryu, Akagi, Kaga. By the end of the day, all four Japanese carriers have been destroyed. Hundreds of young men dead, maimed, burned, or left to drown.
24 hours later, the injured Yorktown is still afloat and headed home, escorted by the destroyer Hammond. What nobody sees is the enemy submarine below the surface, with two sitting ducks in her sights. Japanese torpedoes split the Hammond in two, taking 81 men to the bottom and mortally wound Yorktown. For nearly a day, the carrier lingers on the surface, refusing to die. Yorktown radioman Lloyd Childers is in sick bay on a nearby ship with serious wounds to both legs. He watches his carrier go down. This huge ship slowly sank below the, the water, the, the waves, until it disappeared. And we watched it until it uh, was completely gone. It's very brutal business. My other thoughts were that uh, it's a terrible thing that so-called civilized nations could do things like that to each other, convincing me that we're not really civilized yet. It is day 19 of the expedition. It has been hours since Robert Ballard sent a robot vehicle down nearly 17,000 feet to find the USS Yorktown. And half a century since Bill Sergi has seen his carrier. Okay, fly that heading now. Ballard has only a week left to find the Yorktown. After six long hours, the ATV finally reaches bottom, over three miles deep. All they see are rocks that have probably rested here undisturbed for a thousand years. And you want to keep looking to the left. You're looking into your HMIs. Yet within a few moments of touching down, they see something. Something that shouldn't be there. A smooth patch of ground, clear of rock, as though something had swept across the bottom. Something unnatural, something man-made. They follow the trail. Bingo, bingo, bingo. Suddenly, a glint, a shiny metallic glint catches the video eye. Get ahead, range 150 feet. Keep it nice and high. He's looking up though. He needs to look down if you want. I want him to look down, look down and away picture. from those. And you should be coming around on a heading. And now the sonar on the ATV itself is announcing something big and oddly beautiful dead ahead. There, there it is. Stop, stop, stop. Straight ahead. Change your range scales in on OAS. Now she blows. It's definitely your I'm lateraling left. There's no question about that. The Yorktown, at last exactly where Ballard thought it would be. Okay, just hold that, hold that still. Yeah, don't you know what, my the, uh, always see anyone? Try to hold it. I'm looking at my ready room right now. They can up with your can up with the Which is under the bridge on the island on the flight deck. Keep coming. Okay. Too much. Too much. 
too much. All the people that did their jobs, I can see them doing them now. Keep coming up, though. Oh, Yorktown, you're beautiful. To a zero nine zero. Come oh, around. Yeah. Right. Can you go? The Yorktown. Eleven hundred miles from Hawaii, three thousand from Japan. Over three miles below the surface. Her 19,000 tons sunk halfway into the mud, her bow crushed. Yet Yorktown is still intact. The bridge. the flight deck. The pilot house. She is nearly untouched by time, her gun still pointing skyward to fend off the final attack. across the deck and I still got it. <laughs> so I got off again with it at the same time. Thanks again for finding it. My pleasure. And on behalf of the crew, yep. I'm just glad to be here. Me too. That's the boat. I got to see my ready room. Yeah. Maybe next time I get to see where I got all this banging up. I will be back. We'll make it. Go. You got it. You got it. Hey, close the spot. That's right. Can't get in the way now. Right. Thank you. That's a few bills. What do you mean, yes? I'm here. They're not. So I'm representing the crew, and I did my job. June 4th, 1942. America has won the battle for Midway and stopped Japan cold. The Japanese Navy would never recover from its losses. For the Japanese pilots, the defeat at Midway and the death of their comrades is just the first agony. They will return home to find themselves kept in isolation, in silence. They treated us like prisoners of war. We were shot away from outside contact since they were afraid we might leak information. You see the veterans who come back, whether they're Japanese and Americans. And we brought them here to this spot and it spoke to them. Every one of them cried. They didn't laugh, they didn't celebrate, they all cried. They're hurting. And this is a half a century later. Oh, it's their story and, and what they're telling us is 
don't do this. It's not fun. It's not wonderful. Comrades in arms who sleep in darkness at the bottom of the ocean for 50 years after the end of the war, thank you for your sacrifice. I've brought a tribute. Flowers from Japan. Chrysanthemums, which I've placed on your grave. My heart is full. Thank you. It's difficult. You know, you think how many people gave up their lives that day. And they call George Gay and they call eventually Bert and I, you know, your heroes. But you know, I've said and I'll, I'll always go to my grave believing that the real heroes died that day. They, they earned the victory. <laughs>